final input uh, for the morning. Uh, great delight that um, Penny has agreed to come and, uh, and, and, and talk to us this morning. Um, from many of you uh, will have heard Penny speak before. Uh, she previously spoke with a Nyes hat on, but she does no longer. She's now liberated from, from, from Nyes. Um, Penny and I know one another for a very long time. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> from the time when we, were, uh, we started work in the uh, Black Country area. And, uh, during the period of the, the 1980s, where of course there were some um, significant levels of unemployment, um, and, and what I always find interesting is that when we were uh, working during that period, there were significantly high levels of, of unemployment um, that, that became sufficiently politically embarrassing. Uh, that it became the norm for people in certain industries to be defined as being sick rather than unemployed, which meant that the unemployment statistics didn't rise, uh, but the people on the uh, disability list did significantly rise. And in some respects, I think maybe what we're going through still now are some of the echoes of those previous policies and, and uh, decisions. Anyway, that, that's my little uh, ramble. I'll hand over to Penny. Thank you. And I, I, I can pull up your platform. You're joking me, yeah, kid. You know, we can, we, we can, I could give you a whole talk that you wouldn't be able to understand the complete word of, I can guarantee. But uh, I promise I won't. Um, I've got a presentation, but in true fashion, I'm just going to ignore it to start off with because I just wanted to do a bit of reflection on what we've heard. Because my brain's going. Rrr. And, and I, I, I just said there's some really key points from, from all the speakers. And one of the messages for me is that we quite often, as an adult learning sector and an adult education sector, spend too much time talking to ourselves and not enough time talking to people outside the sector, which is why this morning was so fascinating for, for me, because, because Janet was translating things for us into how we need to speak and what sort of language you need to use. And, and the first presentation, well, that fact about heart disease and people going back to, if you've left school with no qualifications and then you go back afterwards, etc. And I'm thinking, why don't I know about that? Why haven't I been shouting about that? And, and, and Matt's talk as well, talk, taking us through the interactions of the economic and the social, which is really key to what I want to talk about in a second, about how things are integrating differently at the moment. So, what I want to do, so that, that's the background from what we've heard, and I think as we go on to the discussions, we can start thinking about things in more detail. So I want to put some of the background context in, in about the big picture stuff, and then I want to focus briefly on one particular area that Janet's mentioned that I think we could get a really good handle on in terms of health literacy and what it could mean and how, how, we, how we can deal with it. And, and I think it would be really useful for us to discuss why we've got Janet and her expertise here as well today to, to help us unpack it a bit. So, that's, that's, that's the context now. Five key context things. Well, actually, I couldn't just say it could be two. There ain't none of them and we've got an election coming up. And those are, everything that I'm going to say actually relates back to those things. I mean, I can, I can wrap it up in posh language and I can talk about public service reform and money and structures. But the reality of it is, if we think about the figures, and let me just quote you the figures because they scare me to death. Over the four-year period between 2011 and 12 and 14 15, the government set out to reduce public spending by £81 billion. And with local government falling by 28% in real terms. And I think, in reality, that is so scary that it frightens me to death. And I'm sure it frightens you in your workplaces to death. And those of you who work in councils will know exactly what the impact of that is. I was doing a strategic options review for, for a London borough just before Christmas. And the chief executive said to me, Penny, don't come here talking to me about a couple of million adult learning and skills money. I've got an £80 million hole in my budget that I've got to sort out in the next few years. 
well, at the end of the review, I went back to him and said, I'm not talking to you about 2 million, but I'm talking to you about 30 million that comes into your borough, and you, you've got no strategic overview of it. You know, you've got to think about it in terms of big picture and joined up. So for everybody who's working in a council at the moment, there are serious, serious decisions being made at a level of cuts and reductions that we haven't known before. Um, but it also falls through into the public spending on adult learning. Um, let's get again for the figures. The, um, we've, we've got so many cuts. So in terms of, over the period of 2010-11 to 15-16, the total cut in funding for FE sector will have reached 30%. 30% cuts, 30% reduction, which is mega, it's mega. So again, we've got to think about what all this changes in money, changes in finance and finance means about how we do things differently. And that's the public service reform agenda about thinking about new structures, thinking about doing things differently and thinking about proving our impact. Some of the, what Matt was talking about earlier about impact, how do we show the impact of what we're doing? Um, how do we think about working in a different way? So that, that, that's, that's the big framing picture. But the other thing that I think is quite, that, that's the gloomy bit. So I'll, I'll get that out of the way first. But the other thing that I think is quite important is about where, the way people are starting to talk about the economy now. And they're starting to talk about not just economic growth, but they're starting to talk about inclusive growth, which, which merges the economic and the social together. And let me just give you a definition of inclusive growth, because I think this is really useful. Um, and if you haven't come across this term before, there's, there's a whole industry of, of, about inclusive growth out there. There's an international policy centre for inclusive growth, which I didn't know about until I started looking at it. And they see, and it works on the basis that equal societies perform better. And they see inclusive growth as both an outcome and a process. So it ensures that as, an, as, a, as a process, it ensures that everybody participates in growth in terms of decision making and in terms of organising the growth progression as well as participation in the growth. And it makes sure that everybody shares equally of the benefits. So if you have so it's it's like participation and benefit sharing. So if you've got the participation without the benefit sharing, it's it's unjust growth. And if you've got sharing the benefits without participation, it's 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 well they define it as a welfare outcome. Or you're a banker, one or the other. Um, anyway, excuse me, my, I can be really cynical now, I don't want to do this, can't I? Um, but I think this is really important because it's, 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 it's moving up, up the agenda. And a, a few years ago, Demos did some work on good growth, which is, again, it's the same definition of inclusive growth. And health came out consistently as one of the top issues. And you've got to think about health in terms, in terms of an economic mix as well. And the other thing is, is, is that the, the, the parties are all, all the party, parties are getting involved in, in this and thinking about equality. And it's becoming a sort of new middle ground, really. Um, and especially if we're thinking about when, when the change of government happens, we're thinking about this, this fairness and, 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 and tackling inequalities. It, it, it's really getting to the centre. And this is playing out in some different ways. You can see some work going on. If you want to see some fascinating work, there's some really interesting stuff going up in, in Leeds, which is Joseph Rowntree Foundation, who are my heroes, they're wonderful, and Leeds City Council. And they're looking at Better Jobs Initiative. So the idea is that is as we come out of recession, we've got the opportunity to do things differently. We've got the opportunity, you can't just rely on the benefits of the recession trickling down to the poorer communities now. You've got to start and be much more proactive in the way that you deal with it. And then have a look at the JRF Leeds work because it's really, really useful. But you can also see that coming through in, in terms of things like how people are looking at zero hours contract, how people are looking at minimum wage. You can see that build, building through. And you can see the contradictions and you can see how this government gets into a mess sometimes when it's, it talks about equality and it talks about fairness but then you get head on with the welfare reform agenda and you get them in a mess with, with, with food banks and how they, the messages on it and how those come out. But, so that's inclusive growth. Um, localism. Well, you've, you've got to think about localism, you've got to think about how the agendas are changing. LEPs are here to stay, they aren't going to go. What's going to change depending on who gets into power is the amount of the skills budget that gets decentralised locally and the amount that kept, keep, gets kept centrally. And there's differences between the different parties in that. 
and how they're thinking about that. But the big thing I think that's really important is about thinking about, for, the, for today's agenda, is thinking about the European funding and how it's coming through to LEPS, because they're all doing their structural investment funds um, plans at the moment. Um, and each one has got social inclusion involved in it. And part of the old ESF money, as we, as we used to call it, has to be spent on social inclusion. So you've got your LEPS with your businesses, but they're not necessarily au okay with social inclusion. And just as Janet was saying we need a different language to speak when we talk to public, public health people, we also need a different language to speak when we speak to LEPS. So instead of going in and talking about community learning, we need to go in and talk about what we can do in terms of social inclusion. So we need to frame our debate in those languages um, for that. Have we got some visitors? No, I don't think so. Anyway, um, and then the final thing that I want to say in terms of background is about governance and accountability. And there's lots and lots of debates, and through this audience, I know if I start, if I say Ofsted, you'll, you'll know exactly what I mean. We've got to a situation where a lot of the accountability goes upwards. If you think about, you're accountable to the, to the skills funds and agency, you're accountable to Ofsted through inspection, but how do you become accountable to, on a horizontal basis, to your local, local communities? And there has been at times a bit of a conflict in terms of that horizontal and vertical accountability. But Ofsted, are actually starting to think about the way, the way they, they, they change things. It's also a big, it's a bigger picture as well, that accountability, because a lot of people have the rhetoric of localism, but when Whitehall won't give up the power, so you've got that local central control as well. But we, we did, um, I don't think anybody was there, we did, we did for, for NIAS the, the other week a <laughs> seminar with Ofsted on thinking about how can you do things differently? How can you inspect differently to think about community learning trusts and think about, and I know that's been a big issue for quite a few people here. And, and Ofsted are, are, are starting to think completely differently. And if you want to see Ofsted getting what somebody's doing differently in a local community, read the Kirk Lee's inspection report. I don't know whether you've seen it, but they got straight grade ones and the inspectors just got it. And they got what people were trying to do. But out of this meeting came, came some suggestions that, and, and some really practical things. And I, I just thought I, it was meant to be chatting the house rules, but I think I'll just share a few of them with you. One of the big issues that, that the people were raising were that the inspectors didn't quite understand and didn't have the right experience for, for inspecting community learning. And one of the big issues for that was that actually they hadn't got, Ofsted hadn't got the right information about what was going on because with short notice inspections you haven't got time to do the planning. So again, they were thinking about how they could get more up to date, how they could get more information, how they could get more inspectors with community learning, learning experience, experience coming in. Um, they were also looking about how they could think about how they could look at across the whole organisation, just not an organisation, but across an area in, in terms of, 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 of looking at how your community learning partnerships are uh, working. So that's, that, that's just a very quick rattle through in terms of some of the background. And then the final one, which is really, really the biggie, is about the election. Because although it's May 2015, do not underestimate the influence that that's going to have on everything at the moment. And we've got a short period of time, probably now, from between now and up to the summer, when they're all, all the parties are putting together their manifestos. So we've got a short period of time to influence on what we want to think about in ter ter terms of learning. Um, and if you think about it in terms of priorities, every party is going to prioritise youth unemployment. Whatever we think about it, that's what's going to happen. So this, 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 this issue about apprenticeships and apprenticeships taking the only, only game in time, time isn't going to go away because they're all going to come up with, with, with different versions of apprenticeships or, or apprenticeships, there's going to be different work, versions of, of work programmes, you know, just in, do you kind of go back to um, future jobs fund type model, do you carry on with the work programme working, there'll be all that debate. There'll, there'll be a lot of debate about the young people. But there's also a chance to influence on health. 
Uh, last month, the Labour Party put out a consultation document on, on health and, and, and healthcare, and that includes a section on health inequality. So there's, there's a door there to go in and to, to, to do some response, responses with us. Janet is sitting there nodding sagely that um, is, is about thinking about how we can do that and what we need to say on that because we've only got a short period of time to, to influence. The other big thing about the election is that there'll be the national stuff but a lot of it will be played out in the key marginals. And have we got anybody from Plymouth here? Yeah. yeah, so Plymouth, you've got key marginals in, in, in Plymouth, haven't you? That we're, so if you're in a place where there's a key, key marginal, that's where all the publicity and attention is going to be. That's where you want to start talking, making sure that you, you're out there and you're influencing and you're talking about the power of adult learning. Right, so that's background stuff. And then I just want to spend a brief time. Am I all right for time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What time are we going to finish? Oh, you yeah. have fun time. Okay. Um, I just want to talk a bit about health literacy because, and Janet mentioned this, but I just think it's one of the most stunning facts that you can think about. If 42% of people aged 16 to 65 are unable to understand and use health information properly, and 61% of maths, maths are involved, and this, this is some um, LSPU U research uh, that's just come out, if you think about that, that is phenomenal. That's, that's 15 to 21 million people across the country can't get the information that they need to stay healthy. That is it's just like, it's one of those stunning figures that we think, good heavens, is, 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 it, is it an effective, is, is that the real figure? And that is, and you think about literacy, and I'll show you some literacy figures in a minute that we can compare with. But actually, and then you think about that amount of people and how that much that costs. And there's some research done in America on the cost of poor health literacy. Three to five percent of the health budget. If you put that in a, a figure on that into England, that would be about a three to five billion save in a year. So go back to what I was saying, we've got no money, but we've got to help people think about how you can use the money differently and how you can use the money better. better. You know, the, 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 um, the, the fact about the men and the going back to learning and heart disease, I was just thinking, how much does it cost? How much does it cost to treat somebody with heart disease? How much are we saving by, by saving that percentage of people, lowering by, by, by not getting heart disease because they do have a loan? We've got to start thinking like that, and we've just got to start thinking more laterally about things and about how we make the arguments in a different, different way. And then there's some biz research, research out on, on lit, adult literacy and numeracy skills associating with, with worsening health limiting conditions. So all those links about inequalities and poverty and literacy. And what I just thought I'd do, I don't know whether any of you have seen the Centre for Cities outlook. Every year, the Centre for Cities, we've been doing it for seven years now, pull together a whole load of facts about cities, <laughs> which I just find absolutely fascinating because I have a nerd side to it. And I just thought, that, and there, there, there's some um, 60 odd cities that they, that they do it on, and I just thought I'd put, look at what they were saying on the southwest cities for you, and think about, and these are percentages of the working age population with no formal qualifications, taken from the 2012 ONS data. And if you look at your cities, so Gloucester has got... 11%, 11.25, the UK average is 9.9, .9, and the rest of your cities are below. So those are people with, with no formal qualifications. So that's 9.9 .9 across the country, 11.35 in, in Gloucester. The top of the list with, with the most people with no formal qualifications is Blackburn at 17%, and, and Stoke at 17%, 17 and at the bottom is Worthing with 4.5%. So think about that and formal qualifications and then overlay, these are really important, overlay those figures that we're thinking about in terms of health literacy. And then that starts to make you think about all sorts of different people that we, are, that we need to start working with and we need to start thinking about. And that's just the working age population. That's not covering people like... Oh, my mother said to me, my aged mother, 83, said to me the other day, arthritis and she went to the hospital and they said how much does it hurt on a scale of 0 to 10 
Now she's 83. She got no idea how to that how to answer that question because it didn't mean anything to her. And I'm going, well, it's all right, Mum. They just want to know so they can compare next time you go whether it's moved in terms of, in terms of your assessment of your scale. But so if we think about people like that, we don't even come into these figures and that and those figures uh, past working age. We have a phenomenal problem that we've got to start dealing with. I'll stop ranting in a minute. So, I was looking at, at, at some, of the, some of the work on health literacy and thinking my way through it and thinking about what we need to be asking for in this very short period before we can be, well, while we can carry on influencing the policy. And I came across the World Health Organisation Health Literacy document on, on the facts. And I looked at this and it was about the key major stakeholders involved in health literacy. And I looked at that and I thought, actually, if you've got a community learning trust, you could cross out the words health literacy and you could put community learning trust in the centre there. Because I think there's, there's nobody there that you wouldn't have sitting around your table as part of your community learning trust negotiations. So you've got the basis sitting there ready to start talking to people. It's not as if you've got to go and do something completely different. We might have to use different language in that way too, but we've got the people around the table to start thinking, thinking about. So then I've got on to thinking about what do we need to be asking for and what needs to happen. And this is where we need your health a bit, your help a bit, health and help. So this is what I think um, from the reading I've done needs to happen. We need to start thinking about health inequalities and health literacy and making those connections for people so that people can see the role that we've got to you know, that we can play in terms of learning. We need to make that very, very explicit that what we can do. We need to think about awareness training for staff, NHS staff, but we need to think about local health literacy strategies, whether it's part of health and wellbeing boards, whether it's part of your community learning trusts, and we need to think about linking with, with, with local social inclusion strategies with the LEP part. So there's some, those are some really obvious things that we need to think about doing. But then I think, what else do we need to do? So, from your point of view, and this is what I'm going to, I'm going to shift for a minute and leave you with this, what would you like to see in terms of policy on this point? What would make a difference to you locally? And listening to Janet, what bits would you want translated to help you with your job in terms of language? So those are the three questions I think I'm going to leave you with. You have time? Right. I'll shut up now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. <Brandy. clears throat> I always like Penny Matt. A couple of an awful lot of territory. I, I was sort of reflecting on our own uh, local position in Gloucestershire in terms of uh, what our community learning trust looks like, uh, and also what our LEP are doing by way of social inclusion. And uh, the uh, Gloucestershire LEP's social inclusion is very much focused on the needs of young people. The needs of uh, uh, adults um, don't feature, at least at the moment, in that. And um, our uh, community learning trust consists of the local authority and the colleges. Um, so, um, anyway, thank, thank you all, uh, all our speakers, for their contributions. It's now an opportunity for you to talk. We've got 45 minutes uh, to talk on your tables about what you've heard this morning, and hopefully, then to come up with some questions. And we'll have a half hour session starting at half 12. Uh, with all the panel members and tonight will be, be joining us back for that final session. So, um, over to you. Thank you.